Well, thanks a lot for having me today. Um, really excited to be here. I'm thrilled that uh, this event's happening. We need a lot more stuff like this in Cincinnati. Um, I think we also, I know Chris and I were talking about this earlier, we also just need to talk about the successes we're having and the events we're having like this because um, I can tell you that I think we're ahead of the curve with some of this. Uh, first, a little bit about me, um, why I'm here and why you're listening to a lawyer talk. I pro most of you probably hate hearing from lawyers. Uh, first thing is, I'm a brand guy. So I grew up in a branding family. My dad was a P&G guy. So my first job out of school was working in marketing and branding for uh, Skittles and Starburst in New York. You guys might know, know TBWA. We did all the Apple work. Um, uh, Lee Cloud, he's very famous for you know, the big sledgehammer ad and all that. After that, I went to law school and started working at Taft. I'm a securities lawyer, spent some time at the SEC. So basically anything that has a stock or bond or equity involved with it, that's what I uh, dealt with in law school. And then coming here to Cincinnati, I've gotten involved with startups and that's really where my passion is with internet startups. And uh, now co-founded the Brandry two years ago. It's been a whirlwind. We've got our third glass coming in in a couple weeks here. So talk a little bit more about that and then we'll jump into the presentation. Here's what we do at the Brandry, just a really brief sell on the Brandry. Uh, we give every company we take $20,000, no questions asked. Uh, we'll try to partner you up with a branding agency. They'll spend as much money as you require on your brand, um, which we think is the most important part that many startups are missing. Second, we'll partner you up with five to 10 mentors. We'll pick five to 10 that we think are a really good fit from you. Anything from a venture capital investor to uh, an entrepreneur who's been through the process before, uh, development folks that you might need, etc. Lastly, we'll just build your network. Hopefully, we'll open some doors for you. Here's some of our graduates. A lot of them are in here now. Thanks for coming, guys. I appreciate the support. Um, really, really impressive group of people. It's been a real privilege working with them all. Uh, things have been going pretty well at the Brandy. Our companies have raised about three and a half million dollars all in, which is a pretty good start for 14 companies in Cincinnati. Um, this next class, I expect a, a lot out of them as well, and our second class is still fundraising, so uh, I'm expecting big things from all of them. Here's class three, it's you guys, hopefully. Maybe some of you have an idea. I encourage you to apply. Our applications are open for another week or two here. Okay, I'm done selling the brandery right now. Really quick disclaimer, I'm not your attorney, so if you listen to anything I say and do it and it really screws you up, it's not my fault. <laughs> Secondly, not every situation is the same, so Something I might say here might not apply to your particular situation. So what kills company? That's a really, really great question with a really, really answer. It's people like this. <laughs> this is Tony Alexander, he's over here. He's one of our mentors. He's the co-founder of Traveler's Joy and Simple, Simple Registry, uh, two very successful companies. But the reality is, uh, it's a really simple answer. People kill companies. You know, almost every issue that stems and it stems from companies that causes problems in companies and kills a company is people driven. It's, uh, it's you know, people make the decisions, people cause the problems. So how do you fix it? Uh, you don't hire anybody, you don't take on any partners, and you don't grow. Terrible solution. So what do you really do? Uh, you prepare yourself for the common traps. The things that happen and kill companies are pretty standard and uh, you know, you'll see 10 different companies will fail for 10 different reasons, but at the end of the day, it all comes back to help people and having the emotional intelligence to deal with problems. Uh, before we dive into the 10 legal mistakes that kill companies, I'm gonna jump into the four non-legal mistakes that kill companies. These are the ones that I see the most often. Assembling the B team. This one's pretty obvious. Making a company with your two best friends from college or your two best friends from high school that you think know a lot about coding or you think might know a lot about business isn't always the best idea. Uh, sometimes you get the B squad. You really need to partner with the A team. You don't want to be the JV team. Um, the a, I put the A team picture up here for a reason. They all had very, really different skills. One thing we look at at the Brandry is the team. We look for a business lead, we look for a development lead, and we look for a sales and marketing lead. If you have those three components, you usually might find some magic. If you end up with two business leads, you're gonna have a lot of problems with your development. Baking cupcakes. Some of you might have heard, heard me talk about this one before. I know Gerard, you were at one of those talks. Either solve a problem, make something more efficient, or you better make the best darn cupcakes. Uh, by this I mean, it's pretty obvious. Your product needs to fix something, make something more efficient, or it's just gonna be entertainment, you know, or added pleasure value. So if you're gonna be in that last category, great, you can have a business doing that. Zynga does it. 
But uh, you better make sure you're really good at making games or you're really good at selling cupcakes. Working in your garage, this is a big mistake. Uh, this is, how many of you know what this picture is? This is the garage where Steve Jobs put together the first Apple. Uh, so there's obviously strong anecdotal evidence that working in a garage works and it's a good way to start a company. Despite that, I really subscribe to the belief that surrounding yourself with other entrepreneurs, other coders, and other developers is going to get you a lot further than working in a garage. As an experiment, we're going to run a really quick experiment here. Um, this works about 90% of the time for me, so we'll see. Jim is going to help me. He's going to send around post-it notes. I want everybody to write on the post-it note. Don't share it with anybody and fold it over and pass it back to the end of the row when you're done. How many M&Ms do you think are in this cup? Okay. So everybody just take a, can everybody see it in the back? Let's guess how many you think, write it on your piece of paper, fold it over and send it back to the end and uh, Jim will collect and we'll, we'll see if the experiment works at the end. Sticking to your guns. How many people know what this picture is? This is the Harvard IBM Mark I computer. It's the first electronic computer in the United States. It was designed to help battleships measure uh, the trajectory of, miss, you know, I guess, rounds of ammunition as they were fired. Those calculations were considered to be some of the toughest calculations at the time. The guy who created this computer, the lead programmer of this computer, was a guy named Henry Aiken. Henry Aiken predicted that the United States would never need more than six computers total. Six computers. It's mind-blowing. The point here is you have to be able to pivot. You have to be able to adapt. You might create a product for one thing and you're probably going to use it for something else. So just the way that we, the same way that we use computers in a different way, think about different ways to use your computer and, I mean, your product and don't be too prideful to move away from your original idea. Jumping into the top 10 legal mistakes that kill companies. Uh, I see a lot of these, so th I'm going to take a little bit more time with this than the last slides. The first legal mistake is ending up on world star hip hop. Uh, this is kind of interactive, so who knows what world star hip hop is? Do, do you mind, can you t briefly tell us what it is? Okay, world star hip hop is where they post all the videos of people brawling in the streets outside of clubs. Um, really popular site, they've got great ad revenue, but my point is you are gonna fight with your co-founders. You're gonna fight with the people you're working with, it's just reality. The more time you spend with them, the less you're gonna like them. And the more time you work with them, the more you're going to realize they have certain uh, flaws that are going to bother you. So at a very, very minimum, when you're setting up a company, when you're starting a new business venture, I just ask that you do two things. Figure out what each person is contributing to the company, whether it be uh, intellectual property, whether it be money, whether it be time, and figure out what are they going to get for it. How much of the company are they going to own? If you start with two people, the general assumption is we both get 50-50. If that's not the case, you better get to a, a pretty quick, uh, you better have a pretty quick conversation about that early on. If you don't have that conversation early on, I guarantee you, you will end up on world star hip hop fighting when the company becomes worth a million dollars. Second legal mistake, losing all of your stuff. This is actually my PT Cruiser and it was towed yesterday. I'm just kidding, that's not my car. <laughs> um, <laughs> does anybody have a PT Cruiser? I'm sorry. Um, losing all your stuff really sucks. Everybody knows that. Um, the, most, the second most important thing you can do when you're setting up a new business venture or working with new partners on a business is forming the right legal entity. There's default rules in the United States when you start a business with somebody and they're not favorable to you. Uh, it's very easy to get around it, very easy to set up a new company. Now it costs 125 bucks in the state of Ohio to form an LLC now. It's very easy to do. It's something you need to do. It will protect you from um, potential liabilities. It will protect your house. It will protect your car. Um, it will make sure that you can't be sued for your personal stuff. Um, the problem is there's many different types of uh, there's many different types of businesses you can set companies you can set up. You can set up a C corporation, an S corporation, a limited liability company, limited partnership. They all have different. Uh, traits and qualities that lend themselves better to certain businesses. So it's really important early on to stay as nimble as you can and find a business structure that works with what you're doing. If you don't, you will run into problems later. Three, protect your most important assets. <laughs> Antoine Dotson said it better than I could. Hide your kids, hide your wife. 
Protect your intellectual property at all times. This is particularly important at this conference where code is the most important asset of your company. Um, it's very easy to lose track of where code is coming from, where you're getting it, uh, who's writing it. It's the most important thing you can do for your company is to make sure that you have your code locked up. Not in terms of not sharing it, but just making sure that you're having it, uh, you know, you're keeping track of, all right, when was the first day I posted that line of code online? When, you know, when was the first day that we took this code from a Singapore developer and added it to our main product? If you're not keeping track of this information, uh, very, very likely you could have a problem later. All of these problems seem to come up out of the woodwork when your company is successful. Uh, as soon as your company becomes successful, all these people who once touched your code are going to come to the forefront and they're going to say, hey, I own that code. That's not your code. Um, and as soon as they do, they're going to sue you for a bunch of money. So the number one thing you should do, make sure everybody who touches the code signs intellectual property assignment agreements. Very, very simple one-page agreements that just say, whatever code I write is owned by the company. Uh, eventually, you're going to have to do that too. Your investors are going to make you do that. Partners are going to make you do that. So protect your code, hide your kids, hide your wife. Treating equity like candy. Uh, this picture is very apt here. Um, when a pinata breaks, all the kids just run at the candy. You know, like nobody can get to the candy. So it makes a lot of sense early on. You don't want to pay people cash, so you want to dole out equity. At the same time, though, you don't want to dole out equity to 100 people. This will cause a lot of problems later when your investors come to the table and they're like, holy cow, you have a cap table of 100 people that we're going to get, need to get signatures from for all of the investor documents. Um, so I encourage you to think about creative ways to reward people besides cash and besides doling out equity. At the same time, if you do have to do out equity, find ways to make it vest. Um, vesting, uh, I'm sure many of you already know what vesting is, but vesting is basically like, here's your shares, but you don't really get to keep them until a certain amount of time has elapsed or until certain metrics are met. Uh, these are really easy things you can do to protect the equity of the company. Five, taking candy indiscriminately. This picture scares the crap out of me. It looks, I mean, this is, this is exactly the kind of van your parents told you to avoid when you were a kid. Um, so every time you dole out equity, every time you receive equity, every time um, somebody buys part of your company or invests in your company, invests in you, what, you're doing, what you are doing is generally breaking a law. Generally breaking a law. Securities regulations in the United States are very, very strict. The main rule in securities regulations is you are not allowed to sell securities unless you register with them with the SEC. 99% of the time, you don't register with the SEC because it takes a ton of money and it costs, takes a ton of time and it takes a ton of uh, legal resources. With that said, there's a ton of exemptions and exceptions that you can fall under. Most, most prominently used is Rule 506 or Section 42 offerings. Most startups use these. Um, that's fine, and it's very easy to set up and use these exceptions and exemptions. But if you just take money and you're not looking at where, where the money's coming from and you're not following these uh, securities rules, you could run into problems later. So be very weary of taking free candy. Also, I would <laughs> encourage you not to take money from whoever drives that van. <laughs> Legal mistake number six, working two jobs. This is... Um, this is probably one of the more common mistakes I see happen. Um, working two jobs, that's no problem. You can work two jobs. You can work your job and you can work on your startup at night or you can work your job and work on somebody, other, somebody else's business at night. But the problem is there's a very good likelihood that your company, the you know, massive Fortune 500 or the massive company you're working for, has provisions in your employee contract, your employee handbook, or something to that effect that says, hey, whatever you're working on, we own it. Right? So whatever code you're writing, even if you're doing it on your, even if you're doing it on your home computer uh, during your downtime, they could still kind of make a claim for that. If you're writing the code on your work computer, and even if it's not during 9 to 5, they could also make a claim to own that code. So it's really important to determine, all right, what, what does the company own? What do I own? And how do I make sure that whatever I'm doing is separate and apart from my company? The easiest way to do that is to tell your company, hey, I'm working on this on the side. Um, I just want to make sure I own it. The problem is nobody wants to have that conversation. That conversation is really difficult. So it's worth looking at your employee handbook, worth looking at your uh, HR manuals to see, all right, where is their ownership and where is my ownership? This guy's not working though, he's playing Facebook. 
Uh, legal mistake number six, hiring your uncle as a lawyer. This is the most annoying thing for other lawyers. If you hire your uncle as a lawyer, they're going to screw you up. Here's why. Because DUI law and divorce law and prenuptials, all that is totally different than startup law. There's all these little intricacies, intricacies in startup law that require that you use a business attorney. Uh, in particular, something called an 83B. Uh, has anybody filed an 83B before? Yeah. So 83Bs, thank you, Jim, I'm glad you filed. <laughs> um, 83Bs are forms that you send to the IRS that say, hey, this is, this is the equity I'm getting in a company. It sets your basis. So if you take equity, in a, if you receive equity from your company, options, stocks, profits, interest, awards like this, and your company becomes extremely successful and you have a liquidity event and you get a million bucks back, you really, you really need to say, hey, when I got this equity, it was worth nothing. You know, you need to tell the IRS that. If the IRS doesn't know that and you get a million bucks, you're going to get charged at a much heavier tax rate than you would have had you told the IRS first thing. The issue with 83Bs is you only have 30 days. And most companies won't even tell you you have to file it. It's something you have to do on your own. So I encourage you not to work with your uncle who is a heavy hitter or, you know, Martin, Harding, and Mazzotti LLP. They probably don't know about filing 83Bs and all these other little intricacies of startup law. Legal mistake number seven is failing to take advantage of others. Uh, this one probably is not worth me talking to you all about because you all are here learning and engaged in the community. If you're not engaged in your startup entrepreneurial development community, uh, you're missing out. There's, there are resources out there. This is the golden age of entrepreneurship. Every chamber of commerce in America is looking for new businesses. Every chamber of commerce in America is looking for ways to support new businesses. So if you're paying for certain resources, there's probably a cheaper way to get that resource. You just have to do a little Googling. Um, another thought on this is working with accountants and lawyers. Almost every business has to work with accountants and lawyers. Lawyers and accountants are really, really expensive, almost prohibitively so. Um, I encourage you to talk to your lawyer, talk to your accountant, see if you can find out, figure out another fee arrangement. Is there a way I can just pay you a thousand bucks and you do everything for a year? Is there a way I can pay you a thousand bucks and you do all, you know, anything within these parameters? Um, I think it's, I think a lot of lawyers and accountants are a lot more open to doing things like that now, especially if they believe in your idea and if they share your philosophy about your business, there's a good chance they might want to help you because there's a chance that you're going to be extremely successful and then they're like, hey, I can do your legal for 20 years. Uh, David Drummond's a great example. He's the guy who did the legal for Google. Uh, you know, they were operating out of a garage. He said, yeah, I'll do your legal. The guy is, you know, a billionaire now. It's awesome. Failing to put on makeup, that's a big mistake that startups make. This is Marilyn Manson before and after makeup. Um, basically, with the point of this is you need to make your business look as attractive as possible. Uh, makeup is obviously a really important way to, for people to look attractive when they go to clubs and stuff. But with startups, that sometimes is intellectual property. I personally have a very different intellectual property philosophy than most attorneys. I think for the most part now, we are moving away from the world where uh, filing for intellectual property is um, extremely important. Obviously, there's things that you need to protect, but at the same time now, uh, it's such a hassle doing it, and you're basically putting on everybody on notice that uh, you know you have this new product, and then they're going to end up litigating with you. It becomes a huge disaster. With that said, investors want to see that you're protecting your your intellectual property. So that's what I call makeup. If it means hey, we got to file for an IP, we got to file for a patent or something, do it. If that means the investors are going to be more interested in your company. Man, we are flying through these. Good. Uh, number nine, thinking you can clean things up later. This one, this one is. Um, this one really kills me because I spend a lot of my, a lot of my job is cleaning up things that were done wrong or just not done at all. And 90% uh, of legal can be cleaned up very, very easily. The problem is that the 10% that can't really, really hurt you. Um, the 10% of legal that you cannot clean up later are things that will bother you. Um, lawyers can get as creative as they want, but if you leave certain things off your cap table or if you forget to file your 83Bs, there's going to be a lot of problems fixing that. Really cool picture here. It's a dog cleaning up his own stuff. That's awesome. Number 10, failing to fail. Um, I spent 30 minutes trying to find the best epic fail photo I could, and this is the best one I could get that was kind of like clean. 
Um, <laughs> but if you're, I've heard, I'm sh I heard it from the last presenter, and I'm sure you've heard it five times a day. If you're, your business is going to fail, fail fast. That is uh, definitely a philosophy we have at the Brandery. We try to help businesses fail. If you fail, you know, no sweat off my back. That's great. I mean, uh, the average entrepreneur in America starts five businesses before they find one that's profitable, or not even profitable, that they can live on. Um, it's an important thing, so fail fast. With that said, make sure you clean up your legal of your failed business. Uh, this is an, ex an example of something that happened last week with one of my clients. They had a startup that they started with two buddies. Um, one of them, um, they, didn't, they ended up not getting along, um, so they decided, hey, we're not going to pursue this opportunity anymore. Two years elapsed. Two years elapsed. And then one of the buddies came back and said, hey, I want to run this business now, but I don't want you guys involved in it. They said, well, we own 33%, you know, 33 and one-third percent of that business, so you owe us for that business or we're just going to keep our equity. My point is when you kill your business, when your business fails, uh, make sure you kill the legal too. You know, set, make an agreement with your partners, hey, we're letting this idea go or we're letting this business go. If you want to pursue it later, that'll protect you. If this guy went out and pursued this business on his own, never even talked to his two partners, became a very, very successful business, they might have a pretty good claim in court that they own a third of that business. Uh, it's, ide ideation is a very difficult thing to pinpoint in time. And uh, ide you know, just because you have the idea doesn't mean you own it. That's really all I had. Let's see how our experiment went. Um, if the is correct, and I have the uh, Yeah, so. Here is, my, here is the theory. The theory is that the, it's, it's from a book by James Sirowicki who writes for The New Yorker. Uh, it's a book called The Wisdom of the Crowds. And almost 90% of the time this is true. The crowd will, on average, have a closer guess to the number of M&Ms than any one individual. Than any one individual. So what was the average, Jim? 328. 328. And what was the closest one to that? Uh, individual. The closest one, 328. Yeah. 3.30, okay. So the average from the crowd was uh, 3.28, and the closest guess was 3.30. Unfortunately, an individual is closer this time, unfortunately, but this is actually 348 M&Ms. Um, did anybody guess 1,000? Did anybody guess 500? Okay, who was the furthest off? How about that? Who? Th yeah, that's embarrassing. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I actually touched all these M&Ms, but whoever had 330 <laughs> is more than welcome to take them with them when they leave. Um, so I will leave them here on the podium, whoever wants them. But uh, it's a great point. The, the point of the book is, so whoever guessed 330, does, can, does anybody want to raise their hand on that or claim it? Fine, you don't need to. But um, the book basically points out that whoever picked that 330, more than likely, if we do this again, is not going to have the closest guess. 350? Okay, that's really close. That's really good. Yeah. Whoever picked the 350 is not going to happen again. It's, it's going to be another random, you know, it's going to be another individual in the room is going to be closer. But on average, our collective guests will always be closer, you know, closer than some random person on average. It makes sense, right? My point with that is surrounding yourself with other entrepreneurs and surrounding yourself with other people who are engaged in similar ideas and similar um, <coughs> You know, similar development tasks is going to help you in the long run. Rather than bunk bunkering down in your own garage, you're going to lose a lot of energy. And the fact of the matter is you're going to be pretty lonely. Being an entrepreneur is, can be a pretty lonely task sometimes. Open the floor to questions. Yes? So uh, I got two questions. Sure. Uh, one, assuming there's nothing in my, in my employee handbook about ownership of uh, code produced on my time, to assume that they, they own nothing. And then two, what's the first thing I should do when, you know, I, I, I sit down and talk all the time about ideas and you know, start working on things. Uh, how far do you go before you actually sit down and put something formal together? Right, good questions. So I'll start with the first question. Uh, in, anal in doing an analysis of whether or not you own your code, there's going to be a lot of factors. One of the factors, the most obvious one, is what's in your employee handbook, what's in your employment agreement. If nothing's in there, there's a bunch of other factors we have to look at. Are you working on it on your own time? Does your employment agreement say that you have to dedicate 100% of your professional time to your job? Because if so, all that stuff you're doing on the side, that should be part of your professional time. So you're violating your agreement. 
You need to be looking at what resources you're using. Are you using company resources at all? Are you using a company laptop off-site? Are you using it on-site? Are you using company pens and pencils to write the, you know, to create the product? Uh, so to be quite honest with you, it's not a black or white issue. You need to look at each individual circumstance and say, all right, I, do I own the code here or do I not? Is it competitive with your current business? If it's competitive with your current business, there's a very good claim that they still own it, right? I mean, that, that's a no-brainer on that one. It's, it's a competitive business. You really need to think about, you know, all right, how am I going to separate these? Are you using your work email address to communicate about the idea? That's another really big one. Right? So there's a lot of things you have to think about with this. So it's worth consulting maybe an attorney about your particular situation. Just for a 50, I wouldn't pay a guy for this. I would say, hey man, I got a question for you. Do you think I'm good or what can I do to make sure I'm protecting it or making sure I'm doing it correctly? Uh, second question, how far along do you have to get talking to people about an idea together before you form a business? Right? Great question. Uh, one thing I generally say is it's not worth forming an LLC or forming a legal entity until you really have any risk, right? So usually that's when you start to take money in. Uh, with that said, certain businesses lend themselves to risk a lot earlier than other businesses. For example, baking cupcakes. If you bake a cupcake and somebody chokes to death on your cupcake and they want to sue you, I mean, that's a, you know, your idea literally took a day because you put the cupcakes in the, in the, in, you know, the oven and then you sold them the same day. That's a one, that's a one day risk and they could take everything. Other businesses take much longer. So generally I say hold off on actually forming a legal entity, but at least have that conversation straight up with your founders early on. Like, look, if we're doing this, here's what I'm bringing to the table. I'm bringing $10,000 of equity. I'm gonna put that into the business. I'm bringing 100% of my professional time. I'm bringing, you know, I don't know, 50 computers, right? In my case, it's developing software. Right. So Right. The ideas we've exchanged. Yeah. So is it okay at that point you assume 50-50 ownership? So the law at that point will assume it's 50-50. So if the default is if you're talking to one other person and you're working on a business idea together, the default law is you're going to form what we call a general partnership. General partnerships assume just however many partners are, they all own equal, right? And general partnerships really stink because everybody's liable for everybody else's issues. Um, so you could really get into a lot of trouble. But um, you know, early on, it, general partnerships make sense. Later down the road, as you realize, hey, that guy didn't really add much to the code or that guy didn't really bring much to the table, that's when you really need to have that frank conversation like, hey, you, know, you can be a part of the business at this point, but we're only, giving you, we're only gonna let you take 20% of it because we are gonna take this business and we're gonna put it into an LLC. And you know, the, you know, so you're gonna have really difficult conversations. Yeah, but I mean, it's a judgment call, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, sure. My question was your thoughts are you were talking about you know, intellectual property and whether or not it's patent. You know, how does that all how does that all change with American events and all that? The first to file stuff. I mean yeah. you know, you make a Twitter, you put it online, somebody else files. Yeah. I mean it's their thing. I know, I really don't like the way we do intellectual property in the United States, and I should, I should disclaim before we get too deep into this that I am not an intellectual property attorney, but I deal with it a lot because almost all my clients deal with Sure, I'm sorry. So the question, the question was, um, I guess, kind of just a general overview of intellectual property in the US. Um, how, how do I feel about first to file versus first to invent? Um, and kind of, I guess, what are the trends I'm seeing in intellectual property? Is that fair? Yeah, in the, in the recent changes. In recent changes of intellectual property. Um, so I will tell you this. I'm not an intellectual property attorney, but I deal with it a lot. Um, here's the other thing I will tell you. Every intellectual property attorney will tell you to patent everything. <laughs> it's because they make money on issuing patents and filing patents. And they will tell you to trademark everything and copyright everything. And, and to some degree that's fine and it won't hurt you. The problem is you have to pay for it. And paying for that is you have to make a judgment call. All right, is paying for it better or worse than the risk? You know, is the risk so low that it doesn't, it's not worth paying for? Um, my issue, the issue right now in the patent world is basically people get these ideas, for example, somebody patented the iPod, iPod before Apple did. I mean, it was a Star Trek, you know, it was a Star Trek toy back in the 60s. Um, the idea of a cell phone was way before anybody could have created this cell phone. So it's possible to get these things protected, but how much protection do you actually really have? You end up going to court and you end up arguing about, hey, 
they had this idea, but you know, they couldn't have operated it, they couldn't have done it. it, you know, it wasn't functional, it was just a drawing at that point. Um, and some of this stuff somehow gets through the um, USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. The other issue for me is when you file for a patent, you have a, basically a waiting period. You put people on notice like, hey, we're filing this patent. So I know many of you are probably Apple users. That's why you hear all these Apple rumors way in advance because they file for the patent before they release, release the product. It's, you know, it's obvious. But you're putting people on notice that we're intending to protect this technology. We are going to go to great lengths to protect this technology. And in fact, we're going to even spend 50 grand on a patent attorney to protect the technology. When you do that, people in, the, uh, in that sphere that might be operating on similar things that you are doing or that your company are doing, they're going to see that and they're going to be like, hey, wait a second, we are using that same technology. And they'll sue you. And they will come after you and say, hey, you can't have that patent. We already, we already operate that. We already do that. We already invented that way before you filed. And then you're going to get into a huge court battle and you're going to be arguing with the USPTO about who owns what, who was first, who wasn't first. The fact of the matter is we just do it wrong. We do patents and um, filings wrong in the United States. It should not be first to file. It should be first to invent. Whoever created the idea. The problem is how do you prove you created the idea? How, did you, how do you prove that you were the first to invent? It's, it's just a really difficult sphere right now. And I think we will continue to see tons of evolution in that body of law soon. Uh, if you look to trademark anything right now, that's something I work on a lot, a lot with. Um, it's really hard to trademark something now because almost every name is taken. It's like domain names. They're like, if you want to trademark something, it's probably already in use. Yes, sir. Right. So just to rehash what uh, Keith made a comment that in the New York Times recently there's been several articles about patent trolls. So there's a company, I guess, in Texas that has 12,000 subsidiaries or you know, some amount of subsidiaries that just file for patents so they can go after other companies that uh, use technologies. Unfortunately, that, that's the reality of the business is that um, you, know, you can make a lot of money suing other people for using your technology. So the comment from Tony is the reason they're in this county in Texas is because they can get into court easily. So commercial litigation in the United States always takes the backseat to criminal litigation. It's, uh, it's obvious it's because if you're arrested, you know, in, you, you, you have a better, uh, you have a right to a trial way before a bunch of businesses are going to get to court. So in this sleepy town in Texas, I guess there's not a ton of criminal law, so they can get into court easily and they can file and they have kind of a free-for-all down there. Yeah. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Yes, Chris. Can you put your slides up online Yeah, sure. I can do that. Yeah. I don't own any rights to any of the photos, so uh, sorry. <laughs> Is that your van? <laughs> The free candy? <laughs> oh, no. I wish I had a man. I was going to ask you if you could recommend an attorney to go after you for uh, <laughs> my likeness without my <laughs> I took that picture. Can you see yourself? Yeah, sure. Right. Yes, sir. Sure. Yep, sure. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the question is to talk a little bit more about crowdfunding or peer-to-peer -peer lending. Uh, these are two different things, but I'll cover them both. So Frank Dodd obviously is a really big, um, really big financial bill that passed in the House and the Senate. That's something that what we lawyers have been dealing with for like the last year. And a lot of the things in it, you know, there's all kinds of stuff in it about things that are going to change. And also this new thing called the JOBS Act, I can't remember the exact acronym, but every bill in the United States um, has an acronym and it stands for something. I don't remember what this one stands for. It doesn't stand for jobs. It stands for you know, funding or something like that. But um, crowdfunding is the idea of, hey, you, you and I and um, seven other, it's Kickstarter, 
you know, five of us can get together and fund a company, buy equity in a company, uh, really cheap, not a ton of equity, like maybe, you know, I'll loan 5,000 bucks to my buddy so that he can go start his lawnmower repair business. Um, this is actually illegal, believe it or not. I said it earlier, you're violating securities laws when you do that. But for the most part, the SEC does not care if you're doing this. Um, generally, if you want to invest in a business in the United States, uh, you do, most people do this under a Rule 506 offering. Um, and it requires that you be an accredited investor. A accredited investor is somebody who has over a million dollars net worth, not including their personal residence, um, or makes over $200,000 a year. It's a little different if you have a spouse, um, but that's kind of the, the minimum. Uh, if you're a accredited investor, you can invest in almost any business under this Rule 506 offering up to a certain amount of dollars. Um, and there's a limit to the number of investors that are unaccredited that can be in a stock offering or purchase securities. So the idea with crowdfunding is, hey, this isn't fair. Like, this is populist warfare. Why are all these rich people allowed to invest in startups and everybody else, I can't put my 10 grand in, I can't put my 1,000 bucks in, my 500 bucks in, whatever. Um, there's, so there's been a lot of talk about this. And there's been a lot of websites that have been developed recently that were operating in violation of these rules. Um, so Kickstarter was not one of them. Kickstarter, you don't actually get equity in the company. You're buying the product in advance. That's just uh, deferred sales, deferred revenues. Um, but with crowdfunding, we can all get online and say, hey, this is a really cool idea. This new light that they're trying to manufacture for this bike, it's really cool. Let's all put in 10 bucks. If we all put in 10 bucks, we'll have a million dollars and we can start the company. That's the idea of crowdfunding. It's brilliant. I mean, it should be done. So this jobs bill now says, hey, we are allowed to do this up to a million dollar offerings. So limited size offerings. You can't do it for offerings over a million dollars. The only other issue with it is it's going to take a really long time for us to be able to act on it. So even though the House and the Senate passed the JOBS Act, it has to go to the SEC now. SEC now has to review this. Basically, the House and Senate, Congress is telling the SEC, hey, you guys have to take these offerings now. You have to permit these kind of offerings to happen. SEC is going to look at this and they're going to try to start to create uh, rules and regulations that work themselves around what, the, what Congress is telling them to do. So it's going to be a little while before we kind of see, all right, what does this really mean and how are we really going to act on it? What kind of forms are we going to have to file? Uh, to really take advantage of this crowdfunding uh, resource. Um, there are a lot of perspectives on whether or not this is a good thing. Um, our business courier ran a piece a couple weeks ago based on the Greater Cincinnati Venture Association panel. Um, one of the panelists said crowdfunding is bad news for a company. A um, lot of theories on whether or not that's true. If you take on 100 investors early on in a crowdfunding um, type scenario, is that going to hurt your company? There is a risk there that um, you know, you're just you're going to have too many investors and you're going to have too much paper to deal with. You're going to have too many um, issues if you have too many people on your cap table early on. We talked about this early on about taking free candy. Um, so there is a real issue that you know, could cause problems. I'm of the perspective that it's a good thing. I think um, people are doing it anyways, so we might as well legalize it and find a way to make sure that people are protected. The genesis of the securities rules is that People should not be permitted to invest if they aren't uh, sophisticated enough to invest or they don't have you know, the wherewithal to lose all their money. Um, if somebody's giving 500 bucks to a startup, I, you know, I think for the most part, if they are really passionate about the idea, they might be willing to lose that 500 bucks. So I'm pretty pro crowdfunding. Any other questions? Hey, oh yeah, Chris. Right. So the question was whether or not we'll see private stock markets. Um, so the reality is private stock, mar stock markets already exist um, in, in, in a quite big numbers too. For example, Facebook. Facebook is the, so far as I can think, um, Facebook has had more transactions happening on secondary stock markets than any other company's equity or securities in the history of the world. Um, we basically already, you know, certain number of these Facebook shares hit the public markets a very, very long time ago. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with uh, these, how the SEC handles these secondary markets. Um, so yeah, we will be seeing a lot more kind of secondary markets, but with these crowdfunding things, I don't think you're gonna be getting a certificate, you know, in the old days, you get a certificate when you buy it into a company, you know? So like a really nice, like almost like a dollar bill, but it's a lot bigger. Um, you know, really nice paper and everything. These, um, we print them at the law firm all the time, and if you, you know, they're like five bucks a piece of paper. The the staff hate me because I 
I mess them up all the time and I have to reprint them. But um, my, point, my point is that, yeah, you, we're going to see a lot more secondary markets. We're going to see um, a lot more issues. The courts are probably going to get jammed up with people making claims for things. Um, it's just going to become really confusing unless the SEC wraps around a really nice package of rules and regulations around it. Yes, sir. Let's say you, have, you work at a company that, um, that encourages, encourages innovation, but there's nothing in your contract about you know, side work, stuff like that. You don't put an idea on your own, you want to take it in, to, like you want to present it as something maybe we could work on as a company, mm -hmm. like within the company you work for. Right. Um, and they don't accept it. Okay. So they don't want to do it. Um, like, can you, can you still take that and work on it on your own? Like, like is there anything you can do to make sure, like, they decide they want to do it later. But yeah. Was you presenting it to your company legally bind you legally bind it to the company or yeah, so the question is, if you have an idea and you bring it to your company to try to get your company to work on the idea, but your company says, hey, we're too busy, or for whatever reason, we're not going to work on that, um, are, does the company then own the idea? Or is there a way you could work on the, the idea after? Unfortunately, what, what happens here is you need to continue to have this conversation. You need to continue to have a conversation with uh, your employer about who owns the idea. A lot of times, you can get your employer to sign a waiver or a release that basically says, yeah, we're not touching that idea. That's not in our, that's not in our kind of uh, product set. You can, you can have the idea. So I would suggest continuing that conversation. You want to keep it really short. Keep a one get a one-page agreement, basically. Um, you can probably talk to a lawyer get it for like 100 or 200 bucks. Take that to your company and get them to release it. And then you own it. Yep. Yes, sir. Oh, interesting. So uh, Kevin asked um, if I have seen much about Twitter. I guess Twitter um, had agreed with various supplier or like a of yeah. Yeah. I have not. I have not seen. I have not seen that, Kevin. So I can't speak to that. One thing I will tell you about GitHub is be very, very careful with GitHub. Um, we had a company that used a very, very simple piece of code from GitHub. And they went live, and it's unbelievable to me still to this day. As soon as they went live, some guy who wrote some of that code that appeared on GitHub, he didn't, you know, he didn't even put it on GitHub, knew that day that the company was using the code. And immediately sent them an email saying, hey, you got to take your app down. And luckily, we were able to work through with that developer. You know, hey, we didn't know. We got it from GitHub. Somebody else put it on GitHub. So uh, be very careful with code from GitHub. Yeah, Chris? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He so Chris just said that's not GitHub specific. That's licensing generally. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. Most most code on GitHub does not necessarily originate on GitHub. It's uploaded. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I. If you put, you know, if you upload if you upload your code to GitHub, um, I'm I'm presuming, and I'm I'm not a developer, so I have not been through the kind of the menus of of you know here's how you upload it. My guess is when you upload it, they have some type of agreement there that you have to click through to post. Is that correct? They don't, you know. Okay, you can. Yep. You include. Right. Uh, free software. Right. Uh, but you can release it without a license. Yeah. So I'm curious of what becomes. Is it just, is it, is it your, is it, is it a, you know, you know that, I mean, a lot of this, uh, unfortunately, the, 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 yeah. Read it because the last time I read it, and I, it has to be an open source license. One of the open source licenses. So the comment is that if you post to GitHub, it has to be open source license. I would say, how many people in this room actually have read terms of use and privacy policies before? I mean, they are the, some of the worst documents to read. And I can, I can pretty much guarantee you that GitHub's terms of use and privacy policy say something about that code being uploaded without a license agreement, right? Any other questions? Yeah, and they, and, they, and they will change it, and they have the right to change it without telling you they're changing it, too, which can really screw you up. I actually got to bring up a question you're talking about in employment manuals. So if you were to try and do one of these agreements going into the company, would it not also be uh, to your uh, benefit? 
benefit to go up front to say, hey, anything in your manual can never override this because every year they change the manual and yeah. it overrides anything. Right. So the question is, um, when you when you join a new employer, you get your employee manual. Can you can you get in front of the issue then and say, hey, um, you know, this doesn't apply to me, or hey, is there a way that I can work on a business on side? If you if you start working in an employer and you know, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna have side projects, be upfront about that and make sure that they are not gonna have a provision in some of you on side employment agreements. Make sure they don't have any provisions like that in your employment agreement that you're dedicating 100% of professional time to the company. Because you, if you're gonna work on side projects, uh, that needs to be something I would definitely get in front of that rather than wait for them to have the employer manual funnel through. Like more to my question though is, can you get, every year they change the manual, so there's always the Well, they can't change. And this will, well, this will Pardon me, you know, override anything we did before. So yeah. So the question, the, to, the question is that the employee manual updates every year, right? Okay. The update, the update to the employee manual will not apply to you unless you somehow sign a document that says, "Hey, if it updates every year, it applies to me." So you, you, that is a contract right. So um, again, I would just look at what you're signing, read what you're always read what you're signing and um, confirm that that does not apply to you. But yeah, if you sign an agreement that says, hey, the employee manual wasn't signed to me, then it, no matter how many times it's updated, it won't apply to you. Right. Yeah, Jim. Um, uh, yeah, so my, just coming back to crowdfunding. Sure. Would, would it really be the case that you'd end up with um, like 100 or 1,000 people on the account table if you did some kind of Kickstarter-esque uh, offering? Um, or with that platform, have some kind of entity that they've put in the middle? Yep. How does it look like? So the, the question is, how will crowdfunding work in terms of, okay, if you do something like a Kickstarter, you know, a, a crowdfunding website, will you really have 100 investors or will they have one, you know, entity investing through that one entity? So what you're asking about is syndication. Syndication is where you have five investors that pool their money together. I'm, so, I'm seeing yawns. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'll be finished here in a minute. Um, so it's when syndication is when you pull five empl employees money or five people's money into one LLC, into one company, and that one company invests into your company, right? So that's syndication. The problem is for securities regulations, the way that we count people or members or persons, as we call them in the law, um, it's different depending on the regulation. So for Rule 506 offerings, for example, you can have an unlimited number of accredited investors, but you can have a limited number of unaccredited investors. But for the Investment Company Act, you can only have 100 people in your offering altogether. And the way that they calculate people is totally different. One of them, they count spouses as one individual. The other, they count them as two individuals. So the point is that even though you have people investing through a syndicate, if it's five people in the syndicate, you have five investors. And again, it depends on if you're looking at the Investment Company Act or the securities regs. Hey guys, I really appreciate your time. I had a great time. Whoever wants the M&Ms, they're yours.